Welcome to this session, Housing as a Human Right. My name is Angela Carr and I'm going to be the chair today. And I'm pretty excited to be asked to chair this session because I've also done a bit of my own housing activism with Geelong Housing Action Group. So it is a passion of mine as well. Um, and I am a member of Socialist Alliance. So I am going to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we're meeting, on the land of the Kulin Nations and an alliance of five Aboriginal nations. They are the rightful and sovereign owners of this land on which we live, work and organise. This land was never ceded and it was stolen land. We pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. And as socialists, we pledge to forcefully fight against all the manifestations of colonisation, such as children being stolen from their parents and communities, incarcerations of Indigenous people and deaths in custody, and the huge poverty gap and the high unemployment in Indigenous communities. This always was and always will be Aboriginal land. So we do have some amazing speakers, um, anti-poverty and housing activists here today. So I think it is going to be a really exciting session for you all. Um, so I really do thank Margaret, Karen, Kerry, Rachel and Kristen for coming along this afternoon. Rents and interest rates are rising, resulting in the worst housing crisis in generations. So this panel will discuss the housing crisis and activist responses. So the speakers will each speak for about 10 minutes. Um, and so the first person we'd like to ask to speak is Margaret Kelly. So Margaret is a resident of the Barack Beacon Estate and a housing activist. <laughs> Okay, the housing activist was something I've only become since the 13th of December 2021 and I'm so grateful to all the people who were keeping their eyes on what was happening because I was in what I thought was my safe home until 13th of December 2021, like, like a lobster not knowing the water was being gradually, temperature was gradually rising. Um, on that day, um, a team of people from Homes Victoria arrived and door knocked around the estate saying, oh, we're going to relocate you, we're redeveloping. Before that, there had never been a whisper of Port Melbourne being involved in the redevelopment. Just like everybody else, I was reading the newspaper and going, oh good, they're building more public housing. Little did I know. Um, so, sorry, I need my notes. Um, yeah, so fortunately, people came along to explain to us what was going on, which I have to tell you was not Homes Victoria. Um, it turned out we were part of something called the Big Housing Built. Homes Victoria didn't mention this to us. Um, so we were the 11th estate involved in this, I think. Um, so it turns out the Big housing build has this method of operation where first of all they remove all the tenants like because they're really annoying and shouldn't be in public housing it makes it very hard to run um, then they demolish the buildings as soon as possible as in walker street in northcote then in most cases they leave the site empty for years so and what they are rebuilding on it is zero public housing, a smattering of what community housing, which you can debate the merits of, but, you know, I chose public housing. That was where I was expecting to live for the rest of my life now. Um, and they're going to be building a lot of private, expensive housing. Um, and there's this other category, affordable, but I can't figure out who it's affordable for. Certainly not me. Um, it's like housing communities. Sorry? It's, affordable housing is like housing communities. 
Oh, no. It's, it's, yeah, yeah, it's a whole new sector, and apparently they're defining it as 90% of the market rent. Um, I live in Port Melbourne. Of course, when I moved to where I am, you couldn't give property away, um, but now 90% of the market rent would be somewhat more than my income, so won't work for me. Um, so as far as I can work out, and I'm sorry, I didn't bring all my statistics with me, so I'm making it up. Um, I think, like, they've demolished about 16, 1,700 units. Um, in most cases, they don't... Ta they're very secretive about the housing that was actually on these properties, um, but from what tenants have said, it was mostly two, three, four bedroom family homes. They are replacing it with they, what they call a 10% uplift, um, but that's the number of units. Actually, the units will mostly be one bedroom, because apparently that's what they think everybody deserves these days. Um, and so actually, there will be significantly less housing, less people can be housed in the units, in their social housing that they will be building. Um, Kerry can probably explain this much better. Um, well, I don't know that much better, but it comes into <laughs> what I'm going to talk about. Yes. Um, so they have dumped, I reckon, in the last five years, around about 5,000 people on the housing market. Most of them have gone into private rentals. So that is quite a few houses that other people can't rent um, or they've gone into public housing which means that or, or community housing which means that all those people on the waiting list won't get into housing. Um, meanwhile it seems to me that the private market has actually been very inefficient at providing housing. Um, so Kerry just brought my attention to Fisherman's Bend, very near me, where they haven't built the infrastructure to get people in and out of Fisherman's Bend, so that stalled the development. There could be a lot of housing there. Um, there's all the short-stay apartments. There's um, Apparently people buy properties and just leave them empty because landlords are really... Tenants are really annoying. Um, um, and then I've just learnt this new word, which is land banking, where you buy up land until you want to do something with it. So we have a site in Port Melbourne, right where the tourists arrive, that has been land banked now for about 16 years. It used to be a creche and a childcare centre. Um, and a gym, sorry. Um, so, you know... I don't think the private market is doing a really good job of providing housing for people. This housing shortage that suddenly become the reason why they have to pull my house down um, didn't just happen. It happened on this government's watch. They've been in power for 10 years. Um, OK, so... In the last six months... I've kind of felt like I've been living in hell, really, because the the people left there as they moved people out were the most vulnerable, the most difficult to house. There have been all sorts of welfare issues that they are not paying it any attention when um, Fiona from um, Hague Housing for the Aged Action Group brought this to attention. They said, oh, no, we've got lots of services. We'll put them in our next newsletter. No, they didn't do that. Um, I mean, they don't want people to have support. They don't want them to have services. This is their 11th estate. They're really quite good at getting people out of estates now. So we had quite a bit of resistance at the beginning. We had people saying, no, I'm not moving. I'm staying put. They picked them off 
like, if they thought you were a challenge, they bribed you. They rang me and said, oh, yes, we're so interested in your opinions. And of course, we'll find exactly the right house for you. I hung up on them. Unfortunately, quite a few other people didn't. And then there were the really vulnerable people, the people who were terrified of winding up homeless, and they said, you know, if you don't fall into line. <laughs> um, so they got quite a few people out quite quickly. Um, and as I've been able to stay in touch with quite a few people. Um, I know some people got deals they're happy with, but many people, even though they've been built into nice houses, have been very, very unhappy. They've been very stressed. Um, you know, they've discovered that <laughs> you can't just pull somebody out of a community and expect everything's going to be lovely. We had many people who had built, been lived there since the estate was built. We had at least one family where the, there were three generations living on the estate and they've been scattered all over the place. One's in Paran, one's in Carlton, so, you know. Um, and, yeah, there's lots of research that says forced relocation damages people. And I realise that, you know, When people choose to relocate, they don't usually choose to do it when they've just been diagnosed with cancer, when their kidneys have just failed and they've got to learn to live with dialysis. Um, <laughs> they don't choose to, to move when they've got an elderly dog that they know is going to be totally confused in a new place. <laughs> I mean, sorry, I'm making light of that one, but that's, that's my issue. Um, People don't choose to move when they're in a disastrous situation. You know, they choose to move for good reasons. And when people are forced to relocate, um, you know, public housing contains the most vulnerable of the, the vulnerable, really, apart from the people who can't get into public housing. That's worse. But um, it's the very definition of, of the people who live in public housing. Um, so the current state of it, I'm actually the last tenant left on the estate. I'm going through the gruelling VCAP process. Um, the Homes Victoria has wasted a lot of people's time at VCAT and I've realised now that one of the reasons they were doing that was that they pulled down the first of the blocks over that time. So that's kind of been a shock to me because I wasn't doing my usual round of the estate and um, so one block is gone. It took them two and a half da days to remove a family home and another day to clear up the rubble. Um, so one of our very early thoughts was but these are good buildings, why are they doing it? Why would you do that? We were just ignored. Um, we were very lucky to be able to have the involvement of a not-for-profit architect office who came and did the feasibility study Homes Victoria did not do. Yes, thank you, Kerry. Yeah, it's all right, I'll just... So. I forgot to bring everything today. So Office did this 96-page report um, which explains by they can achieve everything the government wants, including 238 new properties. Um, they could have done it without relocating all the tenants, so all those expenses wouldn't be the case. And it would save $88 million, which isn't chump change apart unless you're yeah, unless you're using the taxpayers' money, apparently $88 million is chump change. Um, I honestly thought this was a winner, but they will not look at it. <laughs> they looked at it. They've looked at it to see how they can combat it, you know. Um, 
that we have all these people who have no qualifications saying, oh, no, I don't like that. Oh, I don't think that's true. When it's detailed in great detail, um, can't think of the word, but it's had several different people check all the facts. Um, we've had several architects. The architects who did this win awards, but apparently the opinion of an accountant outweighs them, so who knows? So, yeah, that is the current state. Um, we have a lot of people galvanised now who know about it. Um, They've fenced the whole estate. They've left me a little gap I can get in and out of on my mobility scooter. I had to point that out to them that it didn't fly, so I, they were going to need to leave a path open. Um, we have a Facebook group called Save Barrett Beacon. I did not bring flyers, but all those, if you just do a search for Save Barrett Beacon, you will find our Facebook group. You don't have to be... Facebook members um, and you will find information there so please support us. Thank you. Thank you for that Margaret and I think you've really um, given the audience a really good overview of the things that the state government are actually doing at the moment because I don't think the broader public actually understand what's really going on. So thank you, thank you for your activism. So the next person that we have here to speak to us today is Karen Brown. Karen Brown is a leading activist in Action for Public Housing and has travelled down from New South Wales to talk to us. So take it away, Karen. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. Uh, the housing market. The housing market is a construct of bankers, investors and developers backed by the government. They talk of supply and demand and free market in housing. It's nonsense. This works for goods and services. For example, a demand for giant TVs can be met by manufacturing more giant TVs. And there's a certainty that people will buy them. We can all live without a giant TV. We can't live without housing. There is, of course, huge demand for housing, to live in and to invest in for profit. Housing needs land. You cannot manufacture more land. It is finite. Airspace above the land is also finite. The property investment game involves what is basically imaginary money being lent by banks to invested investors and shifted to the developers or vendors. This is only possible if you have a lot of imaginary money to start with. Developers are only too happy to meet this demand. This closed circle sets the housing prices as they like. 1% of the population owns 25% of all investment properties. Regular people can hardly compete with that. They have no influence. In the year to May 2021, the median house price in Sydney rose by the average weekly wage every single day. And home ownership gets further and further out of reach, unsurprisingly. In this dire housing crisis, all solutions lean towards home ownership nevertheless. The common phrase is getting onto the property ladder. An example of this is the first homeowners grant from the government. It's a once in a lifetime chunk of money in the hope that they can permanently abrogate the responsibility for your housing needs. This approach hasn't worked for medicine or for education and it isn't working for housing. It is well known also that the first homeowner's grant just pushes up the prices of housing. The only way we can have decent housing for everyone is for the government to provide it. Public housing tenants pay 25% of their income in rent, so a full-time worker pays more than a pensioner. They pretend they can't afford more public housing, but of course they can. The minuscule amount that exists means it is only available to the most vulnerable and desperate people. Those with high needs are housed but not given the care they need to live their best life. This in turn causes social problems which are blamed on public housing itself when it is actually the only real support 
available once they can get it. If there was way, way more public housing, there would be a far more realistic representation of the population living in it. Yet governments persist with the idea that it is a safety net rather than treating as it as housing security for the whole population. With secure housing, people can be free to use their abilities elsewhere, so they don't need their lives to be forever mucked around by landlords and mortgages. With public housing available to everyone if needed, landlords would have to compete for tenants rather than tenants competing for stupidly expensive homes. Evictions and massive rent rises would be too much of a gamble for them with a greatly reduced pool of renters. If the federal government invested their $10 billion they have for their half in actual housing, this could make a good start towards a bigger, more inclusive and permanent stock of public housing. People pay rent. Landlords make money from this, so can the government. If they built and owned and ran housing themselves for a majority of the population, instead of just for the very poor. Instead, they are kicking the can down the road, gambling on the stock market to maybe build a bit of public housing sometime in the future. We need housing now. State governments, meanwhile, think it's a good idea to demolish public housing. They hand great swathes of publicly owned land to developers forever in return for a handful of extra public homes or social homes or community housing provider homes or affordable homes or whatever they want to call them. Not many. The housing crisis is the worst in most people's memory and to remove hundreds of homes from the existing housing stock makes no sense at all. In Waterloo, where I live, they plan to demolish 749 homes to be replaced by 846 social homes and will be run by private enterprise. They are called not-for-profit, but their CEOs make 300,000 a year. So no wonder there's no profit. <laughs> on the, on the, site, the site of the existing 749 homes, there will be also almost 3,000 market rent homes and they'll all happen in about 15 or 20 years, hopefully. That means more than 800 of us will jump onto the front of the 57,000 10 year long waiting list for public housing in New South Wales. Uh, so apologies to those other people waiting. Th there is also a climate crisis and as single-use plastics are being banned, it is about time we ban single-use buildings. In Glebe, public housing that is only 35 years old is earmarked for demolition. In their pitch to tenants, they consistently claim there will be more and better public housing. Better, they say, as all will be wheelchair accessible. That they will be suitable for living from the cradle to the grave. That is already way more than 35 years for me, so I don't buy that. Most people don't need it either. Build new housing with, that are accessible for those that do need it. Don't use it as an excuse to demolish perfectly good buildings. The carbon that's emitted during construction is permanent. Every time a building is demolished and replaced with another, there is more emissions added to the first ones from the previous building. It is far better to retain existing buildings repair them and add to them than to knock them down. This can be done now and now is when we need it. Repair existing buildings, refurbish vacant ones to make them into decent homes. Build more for sure, but we need more immediate action. Over 10,000 housing developments in Victoria and over 16,400 in New South Wales have, are already approved and waiting to be built. With a, with a shortage of labour and 29% increase in costs of building supplies, it will be a long time before they are built. Developers are not willing to risk high density builds at, at, in that situation and they don't want to flood the market anyway with housing because it will reduce prices and hence their profits. So no demolitions, no new building sites are needed because there is already that many waiting to be built on. How's as many people as possible in existing buildings. Use the resources and labour that is available to repair and rehabilitate, not to demolish. 
In Waterloo, over the decades, NGOs, academics, volunteers have worked hard to identify the needs of this very diverse and high needs public housing community and to go some way to meeting them. This has been guided by the community and should be allowed to continue to build on this. We are a community and we have fought against the proposal since it was announced in December 2015. We set up a 24 hour tent embassy with the blessing of local elders and had a petition which was signed by 50,000 people calling for public housing only on public land. Local homeowners created and funded an art project that put coloured lights in all the windows of the two tallest buildings and they made a documentary about this and our fight. We had a shop front space with a scale model of the estate manned by tenants and other volunteers where we could listen to concerned and try to give up to date info. And people would come in, look at the model and say, yeah, I live here, you know, I live here. It was lovely. Uh, in our discussions with tenants, with other tenants, we, we had uh, 125 outstanding horror stories of maintenance, <laughs> which we're all familiar with, I think. Um, so we, we put in 125 applications to the Tenancy Tribunal about those maintenance issues. And every time someone goes to the Tenancy Tribunal, the Department of Housing has to send a person there. That's a lot of hours for them. So they got those, we got those 125 things fixed up quick, smart, and a whole lot more. So we'll take that win for our community um, and we'll keep fighting because, you know, that's a win. We will not give up. We are a community. We work together. We've been working together for seven years and we're going to keep doing it. Karen, it sounds like you've been doing some really fabulous activism up there and you've provided us with some really like, reasonable and rational strategies to actually fix this crisis if we could get the government to actually have the political will to do so. So thank you. So our next speaker today is Kerry Brins. Kerry is a long-time public housing activist and resident of public housing. So I'll just take Where this... Oh, you can sit over there. I'll just bring the equipment over to you. I'd like to acknowledge we're meeting on Wurundjeri, Woiwurrung and Boonwurrung country and pay my respects to their elders past and present. So we're experiencing the managed decline of public housing at the moment. Um, the government wants to reduce the buildings and the administration to a basket case in order to justify handing it over to the corporatised housing associations and privatising the assets. Um, so how this translates for tenants is that, um, you know, if you've got serious maintenance issues that require capital works, you have to nag and nag for months, if not years, before they get done. Um, a neighbour of mine has had termite problems since they moved in a few years ago and uh, one of our other neighbours helped her to complain to the higher ups. So the whole street got sprayed but um, in her case the termites are still there and they came back a few months ago and said, um, yeah this is terrible, you know, we've got to keep going. I've seen all the erosion in her house at the skirting boards and so on and she's just emotionally exhausted from having to ring all the time. So it's the same with, um, you know, if you've got um, problems like mould or other safety issues, people are experiencing a lot of um, health and safety issues. But even if you've got things like, um, you know, carpentry or flooring that that has worn out. Uh, they used to um, do those refurbishments on about a 12-year cycle, but they just don't now. Our estate hasn't been uh, refurbished for 23 years. It, it might get done soon, though. Um, so that means that people have to self-advocate, and that's very draining, and some people just don't have the capacity to do that. And um, the other issue is with the administration. So all the local area housing officers have been reduced to skeleton staffs. Um, so people, you know, if people have some issues with their, with their rent that they're paying, um, it's very difficult to get those issues addressed because obviously the staff are very short-staffed. 
Um, so, for example, in our case, I think they've maybe five workers to manage a property portfolio of 2,000 properties. Okay, so, um, and this isn't just whinging public tenants. Last July, the Ombudsman released a damning report into the responsiveness of public and community housing systems entitled Investigation into Complaint Handling in the Victorian Social Housing Sector. She found that regularly and repeatedly renters in public housing report a broken complaint system. Renters told us they were given a runaround by too many people, all too busy to fix the problem. They told us about delays or an, an apparent unwillingness to do anything. Often they reached the point where they felt their health and safety were at risk. Um, neither the then Housing Minister Danny Pearson nor the current one have bothered to uh, respond publicly to her report and they haven't said how they're going to uh, resolve the issues because obviously she gave a number of recommendations and, you know, they don't care. <laughs> um, okay, yeah, and about 10, 12 years ago, the Auditor General did a report where he identified that 10,000 public housing properties were approaching obsolescence. Now, the government ignored that as well. Well, obviously, if you've got structural problems and you don't fix them, you're going to have leaky roofs, and I think that's partly why people are experiencing so much mould at the moment across Victoria. We have an online tenant group where people report these kind of problems. Excuse me. Um, okay, so Victoria is a pioneer in Australia of the housing association model. Not that that's anything to be proud of. Um, the first housing minister under the Brax government, so that's 23 years ago, Bronwyn Pike, she introduced it. Instead of funding public housing, they um, created this housing association model which was based on um, basically corporatising the community housing sector. So um, housing associations have an emphasis on growing their financial bottom line. They leverage their financial assets in order to build more housing. But um, we were told that the model would be more cost effective than public housing, but they're just, um, they don't house people on lowest incomes unless the government is funding them to do that. And the Auditor General also did a report into that about 10 years ago and he found exactly that, that um, housing associations weren't taking people from the priority segment of the wait list. Now they're doing that now because they have to, because the government is funding them through these redevelopments to do that. Because they're going to be taking over all of the um, social housing on the redevelopment sites that Margaret was talking about. Um, so this might seem like it was a long time ago now, but um, it was very clear to me from looking at the figures that the Brax and Brumby government gave a billion dollars to housing associations, yet homelessness and um, the waiting list continued to explode, as it has continued on ever since over the last 20 years. Okay, um, meanwhile public housing has remained at about 63,000 units around um, for the last 20 years. It hasn't increased at all. Okay, so the government's agenda to divest themselves of public housing began in earnest in 2017. Through the Public Housing Renewal Program, they said they were going to um, redevelop 11 broad acre estates across Melbourne from Heidelberg to Hawthorne, Brighton to Brunswick. Um, and of those 11 estates, nine of them they claimed they could redevelop for just 185 million. Well, how could they do that? Uh, by going into these so-called public-private partnerships. 70% of each redevelopment would be private market housing and 30% social. But the sweetener was that um, there'd be 10% extra social housing compared to the amount of public housing that there was before. So, for example, if you had 100 units before, they were going to build 110, but they're all, they're all going to be cramped in. And if I've got time, I'll give you an example, because just one of those sites, uh, what are we, six years later, has actually been completed, just one. Um, okay, so 
Yeah, and they created Homes Victoria as a separate entity to the government department at the time. I mean, it's basically the privatisation vehicle for public housing. Um, it's also a way to evade the scrutiny that a government, a government department might face. So they could only attract private developers to four sites. Um, and tenants were displaced to far-flung areas and estranged from their social and service networks, as Margaret has also mentioned. Yeah, and five years on, only Ascot Vale was finished. And the, the other ones where they attracted the private developers, a few of them are now nearing completion, having started them just a few months before the state election. Um, okay, so I'm nearly at time. I, just, I guess I just wanted to talk about the ground lease model. So basically, a few of the sites where they couldn't attract the private developers, they've packaged them into this ground lease model. So I'd just like to explain what that is. And that, um, that covers Flemington, Bang Street, Paran and uh, Brighton. And I'll just explain what it is. So there were 450 homes across on those three sites collectively, they're going to build 1,110 properties through a so-called not-for-profit consortium, which is headed up by Community Housing Limited, which is a massive corporation now. And there's all these um, finance and development companies on the co as part of the consortium, along with the National Housing Finance and Investment Corporation, which... Um, it's like the federal government arm where they loan money for these social housing projects. So anyway, it's a bit of a house of cards because, you know, if one company goes under, then the whole thing could collapse. Um, okay, so I won't go into the number of units they're going to build, but obviously it's going to be a mixture of social housing, affordable and market rent. Um, the Greens have done some research, and I think our architect friends mentioned this as well. It's going to cost Homes Victoria $500 million over 40 years. Um, yet they're the landlords, but they're paying the consortium to develop the properties. And they say that um, at the end of 40 years, the titles will come back to the government. I don't believe that. I think the titles will just um, be quietly transferred to the the housing associations that are managing the properties. And I think a long... I don't think that 500 million is the end of the story. I think they'll also, they will also be paid to manage the social housing tenancies. And some people who are more learned in this area than me reckon that they will also be keeping the rents. So um, I'll just finish by reminding you that there's 58,000 people on the waiting list at the moment and 30,000 homeless in Victoria, which is an increase of 6,000 on the previous census. So I'm sorry to be the bearer of such bad news, but I just wanted to show it's the kind of business model that Donald Trump might cook up. Kerry, that was really informative and really gave a great assessment of what our state government's doing with that privatisation of the public housing sector, so thank you. So our next speaker today is going to be Kristen O'Connell. So Kristen is an anti-poverty activist with the Anti-Poverty Centre and an unwaged social policy researcher. So thank you, Kristen. Now, I, okay, I've got a whole lot of things, yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for having me, folks. Um, I just want to start by paying respect to, uh, to the elders here and across the continent, particularly the Wurundjeri and Bon Wurrung people, of course. Um, for tens of thousands of years prior to colonisation, there was an ecologically sustainable, um, equitable economy existing on this continent, which has been very, very quickly destroyed um, through colonisation. Um, and what's happening in our housing system is a perpetuation of that violence. Um, and the extreme commodification, it does have its roots in the exact same policies that were the genocidal policies, the policies of dispossession, um, you know, that transferred control um, of this uh, land away from its rightful owners. 
Um, so we have got uh, housing justice and public homes on stolen land, which brings with it, um, sorry, we're fighting for housing justice and public homes on stolen land, and that has a lot of ethical complexity um, that comes with it. So it is the responsibility, I think, of all colonisers um, for us to prioritise work that does improve outcomes and protect cultural heritage uh, for Indigenous folks in urban communities, because there's a lot of heritage, I think, goes unrecognised um, in urban communities and, of course, in remote communities as well. Um, and even those of us who do rely on poverty payments from Centrelink and who rely on the highly residualised public housing system are, unfortunately, we're complicit, we're profiting every day from all of that stolen wealth. So there is ultimately no housing justice without land back. Um, and the people that I look to for leadership in this space are people like Lorna Munro uh, up on Gadigal Country, um, another Waterloo housing defender, um, and groups like Homes Not Prison here, Homes Not Prisons here in Nam, um, and the Institute for Collaborative Race Research. So I'd encourage everyone to follow and support their work. Um, so yes, I am uh, a DSP recipient. I'm on the public housing waiting list. So governments across the continent are trying to use me as a weapon against folks like these to say, I can't get a house unless they get kicked out um, or have their homes destroyed, their communities destroyed. Um, so while we're fighting to defend these communities, which is obviously vital work, we do need to look ahead and actually think about how we build something better and new. Um, we actually need to think about systemic and structural change that moves us forward, although in some respects actually moves us back to when things were slightly better than they are now. Um, so I am going to cover a few myths uh, about the kind of housing debate um, and also uh, touch on some non-reformist reforms that we're working on at the Anti-Poverty Centre and some of the pathways we think are necessary to try and move towards them. Um, so, you know, there's one key message I think that everyone here already knows, but we need to repeat ad nauseum, public housing, public housing, public housing. For now, that's got to be the key thing that we get cut through on and talking about things like, or, you know, the public discourse at the moment around the housing fund, um, things like renters' rights, which are often quite weak demands that people have, things like affordable housing, are distractions, and we really need to try and just focus on that core message. So, myths. We can only put public homes or social homes on land that's already used for it. Obviously, that's nonsense um, and doesn't get us anywhere. It's what leads to these asset recycling programs that destroy homes and communities. Uh, social mix is a term that you might or might not have heard of. Um, there is a myth that that is good for poor people and that we will learn from our betters by being surrounded by people who have more wealth than us. Um, it doesn't actually work, uh, and nor should it be used, but also in developments where it is used, they tend to build like one building of private market housing full of luxury and really great uh, quality, uh, slightly lo lower quality building for the affordable housing um, and then you know the real shit boxes that are going to fall apart in a few years for people in social housing. Um, so there's another myth, community housing is better than public housing, it's worse in heaps of ways and I don't have time to get into that right now um, but there's one thing I think that governments um, and developers have very effectively done which is introduced this term social housing and you've heard me use it a few times. It's an umbrella term that incorporates community housing and public housing so it hides that price privatisation element that's going on. So I think we really need to be clear about what we're talking about, public and community housing. It's slightly more awkward to say, but it's an important... Yeah, yeah. When we're talking to people who aren't across all the issues, I think it's an important distinction to help people develop uh, their understanding. So we don't need any more corporate charities in our lives. Um, we need security of tenure. Um, we need people who aren't sort of determining whether you're allowed to have friends, whether you're allowed to have booze in your house and so forth. Um, so one exception I do need to make, of course, is for Aboriginal control community housing. It's really important that we support folks um, to, to defend that and to extend it as well. Um, so we've got affordable housing. Of course, that's a myth because it's not affordable. By definition, in most places where it's being used, it's actually unaffordable because of the income cap that you have to fall beneath compared to the private market rent that it's benchmarked to. So if we're talking about affordable housing existing in the housing system that we have, it's actually got to be tied to median incomes, not median rents. Um, so migration makes housing more expensive. Bullshit. Um, actually, it's not migrants' fault uh, that we don't have enough homes available for people on low incomes, which is the only shortage of homes we have. Um, and what we have, obviously, is people controlling use of property in ways that lock a lot of us out of it. So that leads me to my next myth, um, which is that we have a supply problem, which we don't. Um, now, 
there's this idea that we can't really solve this problem without building a lot of homes, and then that creates a lot of contestation around where those homes will go, the density, the quality, et cetera, the size of the homes. Um, and a lot of people will, will talk about uh, that figure of one million empty homes on census night. Um, it's a useful figure, but it's a bit rubbery because of things like people moving house or being on holiday and so forth. I think another really useful, although again, slightly less efficient example, is some work done by Dr. Cameron Murray at the University of Sydney. And he's done some work looking at a couple of decades worth of forecasts for population and forecasts for the increase in housing dwellings. And for every year, the forecast population was at the lowest end and the number of dwellings and um, construction was at the highest end. So a really significant divergence in supply forecasts, and yet somehow housing has managed to get extraordinarily and eye-wateringly more expensive year on year. So we don't have a supply problem, we have this control and hoarding problem. Um, and finally, there's a myth that we do need to find money to do these things, that there are fiscal constraints and that that's why it's a choice between things like AUKUS and things like corporate tax cuts and housing and welfare, and it's not. It's not a choice. It's a bad choice to spend money on AUKUS and corporate tax cuts. Or, Sorry, I'm saying corporate tax cuts. I mean individual tax cuts. It's bad for no tax cuts. More taxes for everyone, except poor people. Um, so we, we want to get rid of those things, right? But we actually don't need to to do the things we want, and that's why I think it's really important that we focus on asking for the things we want, demanding the things we want, and not focusing on finding ways to justify how the government can do that for them. That's their job. So, non-reformist reforms. Governments obviously are not our saviours um, and they're not going to uh, be the long-term answer, um, but we do need to increase public homes. There are other ways to democratise housing. So, occupations, which Rachel is going to talk about. There's heaps of empty dwellings. Let's just take them over. Um, building tenant power. There's some great work going on here from Rahu. Um, and there's some other, hopefully, nascent movements popping up across the continent, um, organising, hopefully, towards rent strikes and um, asserting people's rights. Um, housing co-ops is something that we really have not got a lot of on this continent, but they're a fantastic model for actually giving people agency and control, but for low-cost housing and for, again, democratising the control of housing. Um, I think housing cooperatives really can do with a lot of support from unions. There's a lot of, uh, you know, it makes kind of sense that worker, what should be worker-controlled and democratic organisations should be assisting workers um, to get democratically controlled housing. And CoPower, who's the sponsor of the conference, have done such great work um, developing kind of sophisticated approaches to co-ops co and I think they've got a lot of lessons they could be sharing um, for housing co-ops. So towards high quality, sustainable, beautiful public homes for all who want one, um, which is something we need sort of in the interim before we get that land back, um, is to undo the harm of residualisation and so that we have public housing that is desirable for everyone, that it's high quality, that it's beautiful, so that we do have that expansion of tenants and increasing um, income uh, distribution and therefore increasing rents to help sustain it. Um, so the basic principles are do not knock, do not knock down homes in a housing crisis. Um, do not privatise public land, and that includes giving land grants out to community housing providers as they do in the city of Sydney. That includes putting privatised homes on public land, even if the government retains ownership, um, and putting 100% of um, homes that are built on public land as public homes. And we've got a development in Sydney at Blackwater Bay that's going to have 700 units on it, 50% of that's public land, and there's zero public homes going in there. So that should be 350 homes. So I'm going to try and zoom through some things um, we're working on at the Anti-Poverty Centre. What we do is, uh, you know, we think that counter-hegemony needs to happen everywhere, right? So there's a lot of work to be done in the grassroots. There's also work to be done making sure that we're kind of eroding resistance amongst the bureaucracy and the political class and the media class for the ideas that we want to see in the world. And that means, unfortunately for us, doing the incredibly boring work of participating in parliamentary inquiries and planning submissions and all that shit. But we do it to make sure that they're not controlling the scope of the debate, right? So. Things we've been uh, highlighting, fastest and most effective thing a government could do right now is massively increase um, welfare payments, so they're above the poverty line, which would benefit people not currently receiving payments as well by expanding the number of people who are eligible um, and also um, giving workers much more power in terms of fighting for better paying conditions. Obviously, eviction moratoriums. 
Um, even with rules like that in place, there's usually exemptions. So landlords should be required to pay moving costs if they're going to force someone out of their home within three years. Um, sometimes we do have to benefit private landlords, unfortunately, in order to actually protect the people who need it. So we think that there should be government buyback schemes that enable any landlord to sell their home at market price to the public so that we can increase public housing stock at the same time as protecting renters from private landlords who made unsustainable business decisions by investing in properties they couldn't afford. Um, not just renting, cap, cap, capping rents, but actually rolling back on fair increases is really necessary. And I think I had a whole section on the Greens that I'm not going to get to. Maybe we can get into that in the questions. But pushing the Greens and, and their level of ambition um, on this is going to be really necessary because they actually have a pathway and a platform that's really vital to, to reaching as many people as possible with these messages. So I'm conscious of time. I have uh, so many more things here that I hope we will get into in the questions. but. Finally, I just want to say there is a role for every level of government, and I can see James Conlon from Mary Beck Council here. Um, particularly councils, I think, are an underutilised resource at the moment. We need to be pushing them to actually buy and build homes because they can do it. They've done it in the past, where a lot of these community housing providers sort of originated. Yeah, but I mean, you know, if I've got to take a private landlord over my council, I know who I'm going to choose. So thank you very much again for having me, folks, uh, and more to talk. So our last speaker before we go into questions is Rachel Evans. So Rachel is a Sydney organiser with the Socialist Alliance and Rachel is an activist in campaigns to save public housing. So I'll hand it over to you, Rach. Thanks, comrade. Well, hi everyone. My name is Rachel Evans and I'm a she, her, them, they. I'm the Sydney Social Alliance branch organiser and an LGBTIQ plus activist in Sydney Gaddy. I'm also an activist with the New South Wales based Action for Public Housing. And I also want to acknowledge we're on the land of the Wiradjuri people of the Kulin Nation, always was, always will be Aboriginal land. And housing justice is First Nations justice. And we fight in our housing battles with this in mind and with grassroots Indigenous activists leading and walking with us. Now, like most in the room, I'm a renter, but I'm a housing cooperative tenant, so I only pay 25% of my income on rent. This is a totally dignified percentage of my in income to be paying on housing and what governments should be organising for the bulk of us all living here in so-called Australia to be paying. Now, my talk is going to touch on what's happening in public housing defence in... New South Wales, and we've got a little PowerPoint presentation that'll just roll through a bit some of the actions we're involved in, some of the communities that have been fighting on. And I'm going to focus on the successful occupation of 82 Wentworth Park Road that we organised recently. But to paraphrase Greta Thunberg, the housing system isn't broken, it is doing what it is designed to do, make the property investor class richer at the expense of the many. And neoliberalism in the last 40 years has transferred the most amount of wealth from wages to corporate profits in Australia's history, primarily through the Accord. Under the Accord, unions agreed to desist from striking if government spent, kept spending on the social wage, that is, public housing, transport, education, and so on. Unions who resisted this, like the communist-led Builders Labourers Federation um, and the less communist-led but still militant air, um, air pilot union, were deregistered, and that was under the Labour Party. During this period, governments also turbocharged the privatisation of housing through selling off public housing, introducing capital gains taxes, negative gearing, first home loan, buyer assistance, and so on. And state governments cannibalised the public housing stock. It was at 99% of all dwellings in the late 1960s, and that's around one in four rentals. At this point in 2023, we now only have 3% of public housing uh, stock left. So now the government subsidises, um, the government subsidies that further privatise housing sits at about $14 billion per year for negative gearing and capital gains tax and $18 billion a year paid by welfare recipient, uh, recipients in private rents. Plus, there's a $2 billion a year on first home buyer subsidies. So it's around $31 billion a year. And the federal government only spends $1.6 billion every year on public housing. Uh, but they were forced to commit another $2 billion in the last three weeks for social housing. So hats off to us. 
Um, now, New South Wales is the home of the Green Bands. The last successful Green Band was uh, successfully saved the Bondi Pavilion in 2015. But despite the positive impact of the Green Bands and community organising, the developer class has a number of wins for their side in the last 20 years in New South Wales. They demolished Cowper Street Public Housing Estate in Glebe in 2011 with 100 dwellings, the Ivanhoe Public Housing Estate in 2018, 259 dwellings, and sold off Millers Point and Sirius in 2016, 2017 and 2018. Um, and that was over 500 dwellings. So in the last three years, not to be outdone, the former New South Wales Liberal Peritet-led government threatened to demolish public housing estates in Coffs Harbour, two estates in Glebe, Franklin Street and 83 Wentworth Park Road, Waterloo, that's 3,000 tenants, South Everly, that's 45 dwellings, and the Riverwood Public Housing Estate. This represented the largest assault on public housing in New South Wales' history. So in the lead up to the New South Wales state election in March this year, the New South Wales ALP government promised not to privatise state assets, but when they took parliament, they announced the sell-off of Waterloo and 82 Wentworth Park Road, and they're preparing to declare the South Everly public housing estate privatisation within a few weeks. So yes, the ALP New South Wales government has, well, party lied, um, and, the, and the government's doing what the Liberal Party's um, plan was. So um, Action for Public Housing is a grassroots tenant-led United Front organisation um, campaigning to save public housing in Glebe and Waterloo. We've been really reorganising over the last two years. Um, a few weeks ago, motivated by a tenant, Carolyn Yenna, we occupied 82 Wentworth Park Road, uh, but it was around three weeks ago, and kept it for six whole days. Now, 82 Wentworth Park Road has 17 dwellings, five of them are three bedroom family homes and it is opposite Wentworth Park Road which has a large community of homeless people living in sh under the um, shelter of the bridge. So our occupation held, the first night's always a little bit um, dicey, you're just wondering who's going to come in and throw you out. Uh, we had discussed leaving if the police SWAT team did come in um, all guns ba blazing, but the new AOP government are wary of coming across as anti-democratic as the former Liberal Peritet government um, was extremely um, and anti-protest so the Labor Party made the decision not to come in and drag us out. Indeed actually the, the New South Wales coppers came in on the second night and said that we indeed had the right to political protest which of course we do and we should um, and then uh, two DCJ Department of Community Justice um, bureaucrats came in and said the same thing. So we knew we were okay um, and um, and we got a lot of press and a lot of support. Around 200 people attended the occupation in total, either staying for a couple of hours overnight or coming to the press conferences in, in the mornings. We had film nights, uh, we had dancing in the evenings, we got lots of food um, donated, and we had a great forum um, at the end of the occupation. About another six month long occupation that's the 50th anniversary this year, called the Battle for Victoria Street. Um, and we, it, we received extremely favourable media coverage. Of course, Green Left and the activist press, um, Honi Swa, which is the student newspaper, FBI to SER, but also Channel 10 and News.com, weirdly Murdoch Press. Um, we, we left after a tenant came back from hospital and wanted a bit of a peaceful recovery. So um, we declared very confidently we will be back and we are thinking about how to move back perhaps across the road with the help of the homeless community to hold, um, hold uh, office there. So the occupation forced uh, Housing Minister Rose Jackson to come out via tweet day two in the afternoon um, to announce the Labor Party would not abide by the DA that's still in front of Sydney Council and instead go with a, a public housing, 100% public housing build um, in 82 Wentworth Park Road. And then our discussion ensued and we said, no, we don't accept that. We don't want any demolition at 35 years old. Um, and we, we said, um, we'll fight this tooth and nail. We left the occupation and then had a city rally um, a, week after, uh, a week after that with about 300 people. Um, and our Action for Public Housing meetings are now attracting up to 30 people. Um, and while the CFMMEU didn't make that, ra that recent housing rally, they did make our, our one prior to that, we heard from the CFMEU Retired Association 
um, with a statement which was pro-public housing, um, condemning the shortfalls of the Labor Party's half um, and mentioning the Green Ban. So that was very well received. So um, this crisis, but also our actions on the ground and also the Greens' refusal to take the half the pathetic half proposal lying down has definitely raised the issue of public housing as a solution to the housing crisis and I echo uh, Kristen's point about keeping maintaining um, public housing as a solution is it's got to be our key message. This has forced the Labor Party to mention public housing and move away from just talking about social housing um, not at length but but Rose Jackson did not mention the words public housing until um, our occupation um, and Karen two billion, public housing. Two billion uh, yeah well Karen was also saying that Channel 7 the Labor Party federally um, was on Channel 7 in front of an empty block in Waterloo crying about how if the Greens passed half they could build all this public housing public housing but yeah I mean half and the Labor Party generally are arguing social and affordable they're not arguing public they mean social, yes, yes, yes. Um, so, and also we are now in a situation where the so-called impossible rent freezes, rent caps, vacancy taxes, now look like becoming more of a reality, certainly in Victoria, as the state government has been forced to negotiate with the Greens um, over these questions. And also the recent council uh, motion in Richmond that Socialist Councillor Steve Jolly has put um, to subsidise poor renters and also um, has introduced a discussion around vacancy tax really helps our helps this process along. Uh, we've got to think about how to do that in more councils. But ultimately, the way to save 82 Wentworth Park Road, Waterloo, South Everly, and all the green spaces the Labor Party are threatening to privatise under the astroturf cover of social housing is to keep building public housing tenant power, student power, renter and tenant alliances, and establish deeper roots with union members. We need more organisers and activists in these campaigns. We need all political groups to devote resources, money and campaigners to this fight. When our side is strong, capitalism is forced to concede. The Green Bands built the beautiful, brutalist apartment tower block Sirius in the rocks, but we weren't strong enough to defend it 25 years later. And ultimately, we're going to have to unseat the capitalists from their political thrones to have a completely victorious housing justice battle. To do that, we need an anti-capitalist working class leadership. We need to be all ambitious for our class and be courageous. We have to put all tactics on the table. 82 Wentworth Park Road shows we have all this support if we put a lot on the line. Beautiful public housing should, not, should be for all, not just the vulnerable. 60% of Vienna, um, 60 of people in Vienna in Austria live in dignified public housing. Democratic Socialist Venezuela has reached a milestone of four million homes for the poor. Cuba has 100% of its people living in public housing. I just wanted to finish on a few questions for the discussions. Where to for our movement? We have a lot of activism now in Tasmania, South Australia, New, uh, New South Wales, Victoria, but we've all got a separate timeline. Can we organise national mobilisations? Can we get to a stage we are, where we are coordinating national housing justice um, summits, which the CFMEU retired are calling for? Do we need to be calling for expropriate um, the vacant homes for public housing or some, some demand to that effect, given there's a million empty every night? So we have to take housing out of the capitalist market. Let's chat about the next steps forward, the best steps for our movement, and what our post-capitalist eco-socialist housing designed for people, not for profit, looks like. Thanks very much.